Welcome to this week's edition of PC Perspective Podcast. It is episode number, good grief, what is it, 268. It's kind of hard to believe that each week it goes up by one episode. And uh, as you can tell, Ryan is not here tonight. It is me, so it is now no longer the PC Perspective Podcast. It's joshtech.com, and <laughs> I will be driving everyone off the cliff. But anyway, I'm, I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. And I'm Alan Melvintano. And I'm Maura Tettleman. And, and, and. Do you not, do people not understand English commas and sentence structure? No. Nope, the internet has corrupted them. You're too true anyway. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things going on now. Namely, Ryan is at IDF. Brian is learning lots of lots of interesting things. Ryan is not hamburgers. here on the podcast. Ryan is probably eating a really nice steak in some swanky restaurant, and we're not. But we have beer, and we got Jeremy Harrelstrom. See, what more can anybody ask for? Yeah, yeah. Third strike, and we're out. But we did get one big review out this week, and uh, we being. Ryan, who of course is out enjoying that steak. It was the Adam Z3000 series review. Now, uh, we've been hearing about Silvermont for quite some time from Intel. It was their new mobile architecture, and uh, they will be integrated this, integrating this into uh, a plethora of pinatas. I mean, mobile parts. And Jeremy, have you read any of this? I mean, I can obviously talk with you about it, but. Yeah, no, I'm, it's actually the first time that Adam has me at least a little bit excited. Adam Brand has got a lot of bad rap for a very good reputation, or for a very good reason. It's been not so good. It's not been Scottish, let's put it that way. Fill yeah. in the line. But what we've got coming up is a whole new family that is actually pretty impressive. Uh, going from Merrifield, and, and which is going to be in phones, through Bay Trail to Rangeley to Avaton. And Avaton's the one that really has me, because all of a sudden you're looking at Adam, which is sharing uh, a lot of the infrastructure of the core series, up to and including the uh, embedded GPU in it. It's out of order, and it really looks no, like you're this out thing's going to stack up well in the server room. Yeah, but you know what is kind of interesting? Even though Ryan is not here and he's out enjoying steak and probably getting a lap dance from some person in a bunny suit, he did send a video. He recorded a video. He went home and said, I'm going to record a video in my hotel room. And I instantly thought of Rob Lowe. We haven't seen it. We don't know if his shirt's on or not. I'm hoping it is. So, Me Ken, too. do you have that? Uh, oh, there he is. Oh, he's stressed. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. As you can tell, I am not there with the rest of the guys. I'm actually at IDF, still covering the news and happenings from here. But I wanted to uh, offer up a couple of uh, my points and insights about some of the releases that have happened here. I think the most important story this week is obviously going to be about Bay Trail, Intel's new low-power platform, their new Atom processor. Now, remember, this is the Silveron architecture. We'll have Josh talk about it if, if you guys feel the need. That's completely redone architecture. It's out of order. Uh, it, it is very different than what the previous Atom designs were. As a result, even though uh, Bay Trail is in the same power envelope as, say, Clover Trail, it's performing three to four times better, which is a significant, significant jump. And uh, because of that, in, in the test tablets and benchmarks that I was able to run uh, on Monday in Santa Clara at the Intel offices, the result is... Uh, it, it, it really does kind of take away a lot of the competition that AMD once had. So the Atom Z3770 is what we tested, and we compared it to Clover Trail Atom Z2760, and we compared it to a Tamash dual core, a Kavini quad core, and even a uh, Core i5 tablet uh, based on Ivy Bridge. And the result is Tamash is really not a competitive product here. It, its performance is dramatically lower than what we saw with Bay Trail. And in fact, the Bay Trail part is very competitive in performance with the quad-core Kabini. While that sounds like, hey, that's not that bad of a deal for AMD, you've got to look at the TDP levels of that. 
And while Intel is not really talking complete TDP or even SDP numbers on Bay Trail, the fact is that uh, the two to three watt part of Bay Trail is competing with the 15 plus to 20 uh, watt part of Kabini um, from AMD. Now that's not necessarily 100% on the CPU core side. It could be a lot of the other platform stuff. And Intel has invested a lot of money in power savings uh, and making sure that every single piece of Bayshore platform is going down to low power uh, as soon as it can. And AMD maybe needs to do a little bit more work on that and they can maybe make these products more competitive. Uh, but that being said, it's hard not to see Bay Trail as the dominant platform uh, for Windows-based tablets, you know, low-cost Windows-based tablets right now. We also did some Android testing that wasn't quite as dominant. It was, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, we used an NVIDIA Shield that has a, a high-power Tegra 4 that has a fan in it. Uh, and, and CPU performance and GPU performance was, was pretty close in those regards, right? And Intel says that Android is not fully baked yet. We're still, they say, a couple, three weeks. I'm thinking more like a couple of months before the Android-based Metro platforms really start to see the light of day, and maybe that will improve. Um, but I think the really big selling and target point for Intel right now is definitely going to be Windows. And you're, now you're talking not Windows RT, this is Windows 8, Windows 8.1 actually. Um, so you have full access to applications. We've already seen some announcements from uh, some partners like Asus for $350 tablets, you know, $350 10-inch convertible 2-in-1 tablets. Uh, based on Bay Trail, which are, are really compelling options. So I'll leave it at that and let you guys talk about Bay Trail in, in any fashion that you want. Thanks. I'm going to talk dirty about Bay Trail. Bay Trail is a dirty... Di no. You know, I read over the review, and, uh, you know, it's pretty impressive what Intel has done, even though they have not talked extensively about TDPs, which Ryan has mentioned, and battery life. Uh, it certainly does seem to take them out of the dark ages when it comes to mobile technology. Adam has really been an afterthought until they kind of got into the Clover Trail, Clover Trail Plus. They started to really think about it, uh, really moving more aggressively. And the, uh, the Bay Trail really is, is kind of the end of that. It is finally the first part that they're using leading edge uh, process technology to get power down to where it needs to be but still have a really good performance envelope and uh, allow users to uh, you know have a pretty seamless computing environment for what it's designed for and especially with Windows 8 uh, if anybody's ever had one of the older Atom tablets things are laggy um, it just is not a great experience uh, and then, you know, the reputation that Adam obviously had was, was very poor. Uh, with Bay Trail, it's significantly different. It's snappy, does everything you ask it. Uh, it's got decent graphics. Uh, it's quad core for the most part. Uh, well, most of the SKUs. And they run, you know, fairly aggressively. They've still got a lot of uh, power saving stuff in there. It, it bursts up to like 2.4, but we don't really know how long it stays. At those burst rates, I mean, obviously, if you're vi editing video, uh, it's going to be more down the 1.7, 1.8 gigahertz range. Uh, but still, if you look at what AMD has with Kabini, uh, they're still sticking around the 1.8 to 2 gigahertz, and that's up at the 15 watt point. Now, uh, graphics-wise, Kabini does have a significant advantage over what Intel offers, but again, you're looking at... TDPs that are significantly higher. Like five um, times as much. Well, three times at least. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, how that, you know, we're going to have to have, uh, obviously do a lot of longer term testing to see where all these parts kind of fall into. Uh, but again, you know, Intel has this process technology advantage that they are using against everybody else. I mean, everybody's stuck at 28 nanometer. Uh, Kabini and Tomash is. Uh, Intel's got the Trigate 22 nanometer. And even though that process does not allow really effective, uh, faster switch, you know, transistor switching performance at decent power levels as exhibited by, you know, really the, the latest uh, 
you know, Ivy Bridge and Haswell parts that once you start going over four gigahertz, the power really, really starts to to rise dramatically. Uh, when you're only dealing with 1.7, 1.8 gigahertz with a burst up to 2.4, that's really the sweet spot, it seems, of this process technology. I mean, it's it's very, very, very power efficient. Uh, any other thoughts on this, Jeremy? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Let's hear it. I mean, for Bay Trail, I mean, one of the things that sort of blew me away as to how we can compare it to uh, Kaveri and the other AMD products is that with those, they were outputting at 1280 by 720. The Bay Trail was 2560 by 1440. So, in a way, some of these benchmarks are going to be a little bit misleading. Uh, and as Josh said, until we can get our hands on it, this is mostly guesswork for now. But the other thing that was really interesting, I thought, was Intel has now admitted that Android exists. They haven't done as much work as they thought they had. It's, Ryan still had a lot of problems trying to run Android on it, but it runs Android. Well, it's kind of interesting because last generation, uh, Adam, did run Android. The uh, what, Lenovo had a phone that used the Medfield? I'd forgotten about oh, that. I can't You're remember. Right. Yeah. Um, and one uh, one phone from Orange Telecom, K something, I can't remember Yeah, the exactly. overseas guys that we never get to see. Yeah, yeah, some European group. But yeah, I mean, Intel does have experience in Android, but it's not kind of the cutting edge, you know, Jelly Bean, uh, KitKat. I think it was all the older 2.3 stuff that they actually did a lot of development for. Ken might know. Ken, Ken doesn't know. Ken, doesn't, Ken know. doesn't know. Ken is trapped in an iPhone world, which oh, well, I wouldn't say trapped, he might have to but... talk about later on. Mm. Oh, he'll be mm. too busy standing in line waiting for the new one. Ugh. Well, for his and Ryan's, <laughs> he's got to wait for Ryan's too. Yeah. Fly Alan up; he'll wait right along with you. <laughs> uh, well, I think that uh, you know you need to read more about uh, Bay Trail. It's uh, you know it's a, it's a pretty impressive processor. I'm glad that. For pretty much all of our sakes and everybody else in the industry, even though they, they dislike Except having AMD. an 800-pound gorilla come in and start pushing everybody around, the competition is good for everybody. And happily, the, uh, the ecosystem uh, in, in mobile is still dominated by ARM. And so Intel is, is really a relative newcomer to the marketplace. And so I think we're going to see some really interesting things going on between ARM and its partners and Intel. And we even have AMD doing their own little thing, which is a combination of, of both ARM and x86. So we'll see what happens. But moving along, Intel plans a $100 tablet and 22 nanometer SOC smartphones. Jeremy, have a quick few things because we've got yet another video. It's true. Uh, I mean, hey, $100 tablet, how can you go wrong? Even if it doesn't do very well, this is what you were paying for an e-reader. At this point last year. Ryan, are you queued up yet? He's cute uh, in his suit and tie. Well, he's cute, but is he you. cute? But, uh, oh, there he is. The last <laughs> I got from IDF uh, during some of the keynotes is they've showed, they showed off Haswell Y, which is the 4.5 watt version of Haswell, and that it's going to bring analysts, tablets, and uh, notebooks into the market which is pretty awesome to think about. They also demoed a 14 nanometer Broadwell laptop working. It was only playing cut the rope or something like that, so it's not like it was running anything high performance, but they were showing silicon being up and running, uh, which I think Josh will attest to as being uh, pretty impressive at this stage in the game. Um, they also uh, talked about, in relation to Bay Trail, that they're going to have a under $100, so $99 tablet based on Bay Trail in the, in the ecosystem by the holiday season of this year. So we're, you know, I'm, we're talking $100 for a Bay Trail tablet. It'll obviously be you know, lower performance than the ones we've tested. Um, and it'll have lower end screens and that kind of thing. But the idea that, that now you're going to be able to get Windows or Android-based tablets at that level uh, is impressive to talk about. And then finally, they showed off a 22 nanometer Merrifield-based uh, LTE-capable phone. They, don't, they didn't talk much about phones at this IEF. Uh, I think the Silvermont architecture, Merrifield, that they were hoping 
with get some big design wins. And the phone market is maybe stalling out a little bit, not as easy as they thought it was going to be, yet again, in the phone market. Um, so that's really all we had from, from the phones was they held up kind of a, of a reference running 22 nanometer uh, Silvermont architecture and design. You know, good to see. Uh, but if you look at what they've done with Baytra and what they've done with the Silvermont architecture, they're obviously working in that direction. They just didn't seem to get it all in one jump. So uh, that's, that's what's happened so far at IDF. Uh, and there's one more day. I don't know if we'll see anything major from Thursday. Thursday is usually the slower day of these shows, but uh, there you go. So getting Baytrail down into the half-watt type power draw areas is still going to be a challenge. And uh, obviously, it's probably going to be a dual-core part with perhaps only two EUs. We don't have the specifics for, for sure, but if you, if you think that you know it's a quad-core with the four EUs running at a decent speed, and that's a 3 to 5 watt TDP part, then yeah, it only goes to, uh, you know, it, it's only logical that they would have to cut that down, lower speeds, to be able to hit, you know, kind of the half watt that a lot of handhelds are kind of aimed at. I think, uh, as mentioned in the chat room, the Snapdragon 600 from Qualcomm is about 0.4 to 0.5 watts uh, that it pulls. So, again, Intel still has some work to do. That's why we're not going to see this SOC until next year uh and it's going to be interesting to see because this is you know arm arm really is still i mean it's the only true player in town when it comes to smartphones yeah intel has like three design wins based on their chip but in the sea of cell phones that we see now uh it's just not a whole lot i gotta wonder if merrifield is going to be attractive to uh nokia and microsoft though that's a really good question because Microsoft still likes x86 a lot. For some reason, yeah, they stick with it. I don't understand. Yeah, because Windows RT was such a success <laughs> for them. Uh, that's okay. They're going to bring that back, too. Developers, developers, developers. They did not get enough of them. So no, moving it's along. It's the guy who throws the chairs. It's the guy who throws the iPhones now. Wait, wasn't that Governor Perry? Possibly him, too. You didn't hear about that? The no. Moto X factory opened up in uh, Fort Worth. And this is where you can get customized cell phones. Uh, you order them through AT&T. And they have like a three-day turnaround of getting these custom owners and, and out. And so the guys at, at Motorola gave Governor Perry one of their um, new phones that were customized for him. And he took his iPhone and threw it on the ground and stomped on it. So... <laughs> Yeah, but Governor Perry's not the smartest or sharpest cookie in the... Uh, hey, in the he box, graduated so. from Texas A&M. Yeah, but still, I mean, look at... I mean, I'm, I live in Texas, so yeah, I know. But uh, he's really just not the sharpest cookie at all. Uh, well, kind of take what he does and move along. <laughs> after, after, smart uh, after he people, stops and on then it, they're they politically oops. inept people. And I yeah. think that he is in the politically inept... Area. What were we after saying, Alan? On the, after he stomped on the iPhone, did he say oops? Was was that like a Brian Erlacher thing? Uh, you didn't get the joke. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm so behind. Alan's call him stupid. Josh, come on. <laughs> oops. <laughs> yes. All right. As uh, Ryan had said, they showed off Haswell Y and the 14 nanometer Broadwell chips. I'm not entirely sure what Haswell Y is. Uh, Jeremy, can you take that? Because I just don't know. Well, it, it's sort of Haswell-ish, but not quite. I'm sorry, it is a horrible, horrible name. But uh, essentially what you're looking at is I mean, I guess it was more the 14 nanometer Broadwell that impressed the hell out of me, because hey, look, working silicon at 14 nanometer. That is the but, weirdest looking chip I think I've ever yeah. seen. Other it's... than maybe like the original Pentium Pro. <laughs> yeah, but also remember yeah. that Broadwell chip's going to be a soldered on chip only. You're not going yeah. oh, yeah, to see BGA. that in a, uh, in a socketed chip. Yeah, yeah. But, but Haswell uh, you know, Y uh, is 
as you might expect, the ultra low power variant of Haswell, because that is the theme of this IDF is, hey, look, we're low power now too. So it's a 4.5 watt TDP chip, which means you're going to start seeing fanless ultrabooks. This could be rather interesting because it's going to support 64-bit instruction. It will actually be essentially an SOC. So, you know, all of your PCIe lanes, all of your NIC and all of your processor is in one little tiny package, which means it's relatively easy to cool. Apart from that, we didn't really get much. Nobody got a chance to play with any of it, but for the next coming year, it's definitely low power for Intel, and Haswell Y, when we finally see it, is going to be in Ultrabooks. Uh, I would suspect the, the sort of thing we see from Asus with the Yoga, where it's half tablet, half keyboard. And, That's Lenovo. You know, hmm? Lenovo has the Yoga. Oh, sorry, Lenovo Yoga, it's the Zen? Transformer. Zen Transformer, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, but I just love the fact that, you know, with all of the bitching and screaming, as always about Moore's Law, Intel is, yeah, here's some 14 nanometer silicon. Try, try that out for size. Yeah, I was not entirely certain that uh, Intel would be getting out 14 nanometer stuff as soon as they're saying, because uh, while they've had 14 nanometer running in test mode and, and kind of getting all the kinks worked out, and certainly they, they showed initial silicon probably about eight months ago, um, that they have you know pretty high quality working silicon and stuff that they're going to start shipping at the end of this year. That's insane because, again, only now are we starting to see um, CPUs coming out in 28 nanometer. Well, maybe not saying only now. They've been out for GPUs quite a bit. Uh, Qualcomm's been using 28 nanometer for several generations of their crate chips. Uh, but only now is AMD getting past 32 nanometer to 28. And uh, it's going to be at least a year before we see 20 nanometer, 22 nanometer type uh, products coming from anybody else in the uh, in the industry. And so Intel has got now just a significant lead over everybody else. In and eventually economics and physics segment. will slow Intel down, but we're not anywhere near that point. What were you going to say, Jeremy? I was just going to say, in every single market segment, Intel is pretty much putting something out. From I, I think some of the stuff we'll talk about in a bit is about 150 TDP, all the way down to, you know, Half a watt TDP. Yet, yeah, Jeremy, it's actually interesting you say that because they had, there was something today about that that um, either, I think the CEO announced that Intel wasn't. You know, the speculation has been that Intel was backing away from desktop, and there were you know that Broadwell was going to be the um, you know test bed for what they were eventually going to do, and you know the end was near. But uh, apparently, the CEO came out today and announced that. You know, they were full steam ahead in all segments, and they were not going to abandon the socketed desktop for now. So, hopefully, that wasn't just smoke and mirrors. That'd be nice if, if you know, they actually were seeing some pickup there, and you know, kind of reverse some trends they were going towards. Well, the PC market is still growing; it's just not growing as fast as it used to. So those nice five ten percent per year increases that we've been seeing since the eighties have now gone to half a percent, one percent, and so certainly growth has stagnated, but it's still a many, many, many billion dollar a year thing for everybody involved. It's just that the growth industry now is handhelds and tablets, so they want to get in there and uh, have their initial small investment grow into very large returns which happens to me at the buffet. And and speaking of Ryan's next video, don't forget watches and wearable computing as well. Yes. At uh, IDF, they also announced their Quark SOCs, and they're kind of interesting. They're, uh, what, half the size of Atom, a fourth the size of Atom, one-tenth the power. Um, We didn't get a huge amount of information on Quark. Apparently, uh, they, they're going to start them out at 14 nanometer. 
Uh, they're going to be very, very, very small. Uh, they're based on some of the original Pentium uh, architectures that, that came out. But these will be the chips that will power the Internet of Things, or, yeah, I think that's what the, you know, the, the thought is. They're not going to be incredibly powerful, but they are going to be superfluous if Intel has their way. So, Ryan, take it away from me. If you're ready, Ryan. It's about Quark, which is a part that ironically, not ironically, fits under Atom in the product that was a completely new product from Intel. It was kind of a surprise. It was a secret. I don't think I saw any leaks about it. So Quark is a, a, a going to be a new design um, that they are saying is one-fifth the die size of Atom and one-tenth the power of Atom. And that's uh, comparing it to Bay Trail right now. So uh, it's going to be a kind of like the embedded processor play. Uh, they're not really licensing their core, but they are making it an open ecosystem, meaning that they encourage other people to bring in their IP, make embedded processors out of it, um, and they can connect directly to the fabric that connects to those uh, Intel processors, whatever they may be. Uh, more details I got later is that the initial uh, run of Quark is going to be a single core, single thread, based on a Pentium core ISA. So they're not really talking about what architecture it is. My gut feeling is that it is something like uh, Silvermont, but it, it, there's obviously going to be some differences because there's no, as it is today, Silvermont is a dual core per module package, so it's available in dual core and quad core options. Um, so this is kind of going up against ARM. Um, they're not licensing their core like ARM does, but they are trying to get you know, these embedded devices, wearables, the Internet of Things, as they call it, really uh, down to, you know, the, the smallest, smallest power levels that even Baytrail and Silvermont couldn't get to before. So I'm curious to hear what uh, Josh and the others think about Quark, even though we don't really know that much about it yet. Call of Duty, Black Ops. Yeah. So, I just got a any, question. That picture sure. they show at the end. That's not going to fit on my wrist, nor is it going to fit on my finger. I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to fit on. That's a, that's a John Holmes ring. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm looking at it, and that, that is the first thought that I had. It, Intel, what the hell? I mean, I'm it sure it's got a pedometer on it, so it'll that's, tell me how much that's exercise I got. To but... a whole new level there. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, uh, Quark going to be so low power. I mean, it's not going to be powerful, but it will be able to do a lot of very, very not basic, but you know, more advanced things in terms of computing, and uh, just pull milliwatts of power and be able to do that. So, yeah, that that you know, the watches that everybody's talking about. You know, even though the the current ones are like looking like that big and bulky and. 300 bucks, something like Quark will make it much more reasonable in terms of, you know, battery life and uh, size and dissipation and, and whatnot. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's certainly a market for it, but they're going to have to fight hard to get into it because a lot of these embedded makers are, are very close to these other SOC producers and have been doing business with them for ages. And in fact, you know, they, they still utilize chips that are made on 90, 130 nanometer, stuff that, that is really kind of old school as compared to, you know, a 14 nanometer product. Um, so it's going to take some time for Intel to get into this kind of extreme embedded market that they're looking hey, at. It, it's sad to know that, you know, Intel's never done dirty pool, like loss leading processors to break into a new market or anything. Yeah. What I want to know is, are they going to provide aloe burn ointment with each watch? Oh, come on. It's it's like a quarter of a watt, TDP. Yeah, but you, you remember what happened with their laptops, right? You know, they, those weren't burning people either. Those were like 50-watt TDP laptops. Come on. Okay, actually, remember the, the Pentium 2 laptops that came out? <laughs> those things were like 100-watt TDP. Yeah, those <laughs> That they will last like 10 minutes on battery power. You had to plug it in. 
In fact, I knew things that the, the ones that came up on stilts this high, yeah. just you can get enough air. Ah, insane. Toshiba. Yeah. Asus, they announced the Transformer T100 powered by Blade, Blade Trail. Blade, Bay Trail. Blade Trail. Blade Trail. <laughs> Have you, uh, Jeremy, uh, you just seemed. Wait, there's a video. Oh, of course, Ken there's just a video. posted up. There is. Ken, video EO. Can you roll the video? Because I don't know anything about Blade Trail or Transformer T100. The last thing I want to mention this week uh, are a pair of releases I thought were kind of interesting. Uh, Gigabyte announced the Haswell based bricks. PC, it's kind of a super small form factor, kind of looks like the Intel Nook uh, design, uh, but this is based on Haswell. It's got two USB 3.0 ports, it's got Gigabit Ethernet, Mini DP, and HDMI output, um, and uh, they even have a version that is shipping with Iris Pro graphics um, as well that I've seen here at IDF, um, which I- I'm really eager to get my hands on so we can do frame rating on it as well. Uh, but the idea of having that much power in a, in a slightly bigger than what the actual pictures of the non-Iris Pro bricks looks like um, should be should be really cool. And then uh, just tonight, actually, Asus announced a couple of tablets: the Transformer Book T100 and T300. T100 is based on Bay Trail. I think it's the Atom Z3740, which is a quad-core part, but I think it runs a little bit lower clock speeds. Uh, than the top end part that we did our initial benchmarking. This is a 10.1 inch tablet, 1366 by 768 resolution, IPS, but you know, not not a great resolution, but at least it's a nice screen. And uh, incredibly light, 1.6 pounds with just a tablet, 2.4 pounds with the dock. And the best part is, comes with Windows 8.1, comes with a student version of Microsoft Office, and it's $349 with an 11 hour stated battery life. Uh, that's that to me is a very compelling option, even for somebody, you know, like me or my wife that just needs a machine that just works. You're not doing a whole bunch of stuff on it. You're doing word processing. You're doing internet. Uh, you know, some Skype maybe every once in a while, things like that. And for three hundred and fifty dollars, you can buy one of these that is both tablet and notebook. The T three hundred is the same kind of form factor and design, but it's a little bit larger, thirteen point three inch, I believe. Yeah, thirteen point three inch. Uh, 19 by 10 screen, so higher resolution, and it's powered by Haswell, the new dual core variant. Um, they didn't mention pricing or availability on that one yet, uh, but you know now we're getting into the releases of the dual cores, the Ultrabook style. They, we, we talked about the Asus UX301 and 302 last week. We're starting to see the release of these parts um, that are really going to evolutionize the uh, uh, Ultrabook markets. So there you go. That's pretty much all I have for uh, for you guys this week. I'll be back next week, I think, on the podcast. And uh, the rest of the guys, take it away. I don't think Did evolutionize is a word. Evolutionize. I don't think that's. But a you word. know, didn't no. he just didn't he also mention that there's a Persian shipping with integrated graphics? Probably. Hans that's, bricks. That's that's racist. At least a little. <sighs> What else so yeah, Transformer T100. It's nice that we're going to have different form factors of these low wattage parts based on Bay Trail that are, you know, x86, something that uh, you and I can really relate to because this whole arm thing is it's just beyond me. <sighs> Shall we move on? Are you getting oh, tired I mean, of IDF? I, one, thing, one thing that was, was odd, though, is that what they did not announce how much the T300 prices were going to be. That's the one I'm more interested in, the Haswell-based one, because those ARM ones are, you know, if we really want to do some real work on it, it's not anything more than a toy. Huh. Now that's racist. Okay. Uh, You know, let's move away from, uh, well, let's talk about the bricks. The bricks is essentially just a headless version of Bay Trail. It doesn't have the screen. You plug it into a keyboard and a monitor. And you've got this very little box thing. I feel like I'm doing Madonna. Please, please don't. Hans Bricks. Oh, no. Hans Bricks. Oh, hey, Hans yeah. Bricks. 
Look at Ethernet's USB 3.0, a network port, HDMI, a small power cable. Um, does it have Bluetooth? Because hooking up a mouse and keyboard sounds like it's a pain in the butt. I no, don't know. Actually, I don't think it does. Yeah, because, oh, hey, I want to plug in some stuff. Well, you're out of luck. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we're going to see a lot of more unique form factors, uh, just like the Intel Nook. The bricks is aimed directly at that. Who wants a small box on their table where they can do their internet surfing, look at imager, stuff like that, cat videos. But is it going to be as hot as the Nook? That's a good question. Probably not with Bay Trail. No, probably not. Yeah, that's 3 watts to 5 watts versus 15 to 25. <laughs> oh, I lied. It does. Oh, go ahead. 211N and Bluetooth 4.0. Oh, there well, go. that's good. You're Bluetooth laughing. 4.0. Isn't 5.0 the latest? I do believe so, but I don't know that we've seen many products come out with 5.0. Ken, Ken you're kind of the wireless connectivity guy. Uh, I think 4.0 is the last one. That's a low, low energy standard, isn't it? I think. You're saying Ken doesn't have a wire? I thought Bluetooth 5 was released. I like don't think it's six in any devices. Ago. I could be. I don't know. I don't well, know. we have this thing called Google. <laughs> Look it up. Let me Google that for you. Uh, moving along, Asus announces the X79 Rampage 4 Black Edition at OC Main Event. And apparently, it won things. Jeremy, look at how. Look at, look at it's black, silver, and gold. Ain't it sexy? And it's got some red in there. And there's Johnny She. Is that Johnny She? Yeah. No, that's not Johnny She. No. He may be an Asian Elvis impersonator, but that is not Johnny She. And it won. But they won five times. They got uh, 3D Mark 11, where they're posting uh, 38231. With four-way SLI, which is just obscene, like that's 3D Mark 07 scores. Uh, 2D configuration, they got 17.55 on a six-core Cinebench, which is just obscene for a 4960X, and a memory overclock of 3900 megahertz. They didn't quite hit four gigahertz, which is too bad because I mean that would put it in graphic. RAM uh, levels, but I mean, come on. 3.9 gigahertz overclock on memory is pretty impressive. Well, so, they sell that as far as memory now, don't goes, they? not only is this going to be the best board that you're probably going to get your hands on soon, it's also going to be the first one released for the new Ivory Bridge E. So, it's going to be interesting to see what people can do with this. Unless you're willing to go with liquid nitrogen, you're not going to get quite those overclocks, but hey, this is impressive. It, it, it's even pushing Titans to the point where the Titan is saying, you know, that's it. I, I can't keep up with this bloody thing. It's insane. Crazy. Well, the, uh, DDR3-3000 is on the horizon. It's prohibitively expensive right now, but... Oh, just wait till my pick. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> or anti-pick, we'll pick, as it might later. be. Later. Uh, <laughs> moving along. Xeon E5-2600. Gets an Ivy Bridge EP upgrade. So it's been a while since uh, Xeon got upgraded uh, to this extent. Usually, you know, we, we've had the Sandy Bridge E essentially on that side. But now we're, we're finally getting the new stuff coming in. So, Jeremy, again, you're the guy who wrote all these up. You, oh, you, you didn't read this out. one? Come on, 12 cores. 12 cores. What are you going to do with 12 cores? Throw it in the server room and watch it bake. Yeah, the, the, the top one is utterly and completely insane. It, the TDP is going to be about 115 to 130 watt. So, okay, Intel is already sh- shaving down uh, the, the energy that they use. So this sort of tells you how quick it's going to go. It uses three rings. So it links the cores, the cache segments, but there's a split memory controller on it, which is something completely new that we haven't really played with before. Uh, It also has a 25 megabyte level 3 cache, which is just sick. 
below that, uh, you've got another step, which is not for the, the truly insane, but still looking for a lot of power, where you've got a choice between 6, 8, and 10 cores, uh, a slightly lower heat, 70 to 130 TDP, and the same interconnects that you're used to seeing uh, in Sandy Bridgie. Then they went for low power. Well, for this low power, you, you, the TDP is going to be 40 to 80 watts. You're either going to get a 4 or a 6 core. 15 megabytes L3 cache. So, honestly, that's the one that lives up to the poor branding strategy that they did. Because this is the Xeon E5 2600 version 2 family. They pretty much admitted that, you know, it's not a huge jump from Sandy Bridge EP to uh, Ivory GP. So they're just calling it version 2. But on the other hand, we have never seen from Intel a 12-core processor sitting at 130-watt TDP with a brand new way of doing the memory controller, which is something you should look into, Josh, because you're a little bit better at tracking those ones down than I am. Not very much. Especially not now. I guess there's a lot of reading that I need to do. Well, there's a lot of publishing Intel needs to do, too, to be frankly honest. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, they didn't give us a whole lot of uh, specifics. No. <laughs> but uh, moving along, more items of interest. Not only did Intel have their IDF, but AMD kind of jumped on their coattail tails and, and released their new embedded roadmap which they talked about uh, which basically comprised of Gabini stuff Kaveri stuff and other things oh man I just want to say I love these code names let's hear, <laughs> let's hear them say it tell them to sing them to us Ken can you sing them no I can't I'm sorry oh, can you give us your, a falcon punch voice. there uh, Josh or a Hyro Falcon punch. Hyro Falcon! Pretty I thought awesome. it was Hero. It could be. Depends uh, on if you're Canadian or not. You know, here, here's, the, here's the problem. is uh, They kind of released this before the first day of IDF. And everybody thought, oh, that's really cool. Look at all these embedded parts. Look at the things that they're doing there. You know, how, how nimble. How good. And then IDF starts rolling around. And the, uh, the competition is, has shifted things tremendously because... All these embedded parts are really aimed at performance and power, and Intel has undercut them dramatically in power while retaining the same performance. And so I'm, I'm currently writing a little thing, a little ditty about this, and uh, instead of you know, releasing it the first day, I thought, one, I'm lazy, and I, I can't just you know sit down and do this right away because if I don't procrastinate, a lot of my good ideas don't even come to me. That's my excuse, right? So anyway, uh, yeah, I thought I'd wait and see exactly what Intel has released and where they're going. And really, it'll put us into a better perspective about where AMD's at and how successful they will be when we compare some of these parts to like Quark or the current Bay Trail, uh, it's, it's kind of grim for AMD because if you look up and down that stack, it's all 28 nanometer stuff. Um, the the Kaveri based part, uh, which is Steamroller GCN, could be interesting in the embedded and signage type market. And gaming, and when I say gaming, that's like the slot machines that have all kinds of pretty graphics going up and down. Um, so we're going to see where each of these kind of fall. In. And that's one area that AMD could survive with, is that they're going to have better graphics, probably better graphics performance per watt than one tell offers, even though the CPU power may not necessarily be there. Did you get anything else out of that, Jeremy or Maury? Well, I'm, I'm just shocked that as an American you aren't immediately going out and buying a product called Bald Eagle. Well, you know... At least they didn't call it Walking Eagle. Because, you know, but there was a Step Eagle. Yeah, well, you know what Walking Eagle, eagle is? Walking uh, Eagle is a bird that's so full of shit it can't fly. Uh, 
<laughs> <laughs> but actually, there, there is one thing I'd like to mention <laughs> uh, that we haven't actually touched on with all of these Intel processors and these new AMD ones. DDR4. It's a thing. It is now going to be supported. Well, that's good. Yeah, and, and in fact, Kingston even did put out uh, some ECC uh, DIMMs that are actually compatible with the Aviton, the ones that we were talking about at the very beginning of the show from Intel. But with the new uh, AMD chips coming out, they're also going to be compatible with DDR4. It's sort of interesting to see. They're not much faster, 2133 megahertz. So on the other hand, for ECC RAM, that's not so bad. It's going to be interesting to see. A lot of them are operating at 1.2 volts. So even lower than what you're used to with uh, DDR3. But expect to see those coming out in the near future at some godly obscene price, I am sure. Probably. You know what's kind of interesting? Kaveri supports natively GDDR5. So there's a possibility we may see parts with the Kaveri chip soldered onto a board surrounded by GDDR5 memory running at insanely fast rates. Well, That's but how am I going to fit my graphics card into the memory slot? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they they no, probably I mean, did that oh, because of the consoles, though, Josh. I mean, you know, all the consoles are running. Well, Microsoft's not, but uh, Sony's running only DDR5 memory. So, yep. I mean, they, and I'm sure there's probably some unnamed. Uh, Unnamed, uh, unnamed partners are going to be coming out with something or other that are going to use that too. So we'll see. Yes, we shall. But I mean, yeah, we won't be we won't be seeing DDR5 in desktop systems for quite a while. I'd be surprised we actually see it. It's the same form factor as DDR4, I guess, in terms of dim layout. I don't know how it's going to work out, but. The specifications are all there for actually GDDR5 DIMMs. Well, you think they'll skip a generation then? You think they'll skip over well, no, it's DDR4, DDR4 DDR5 entirely the for the desktop being and just used do DDR4 for, the, for servers only? I don't know. The plans are still murky. Ask later. <laughs> Ask later. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Magic 8-Ball. <sighs> I am the Magic 8-Ball. What's behind me? You don't want to know. Uh, Never Sell Forever has a new title to it. What is it, Jeremy? And have you tried it? Honestly, I've not even tried Saints Row ever at all. Uh, apparently, maybe I should. It just sort of seemed like GTA. And, well, I gave up on GTA when it was still a top-down. But, hey, all the cool kids want to play Saints Row 4. So buy a new GPU from AMD, and guess what? The Neville's Never Settle Forever bundle now has it. 7950s and up. And, as Ken is showing you, there is a long list of other games that you get with the Never Settle Forever bundle. I think I've got all those. Hey, okay, maybe not all of them, but still. Do nice you get addition. all the ones you want to play? Uh, no. <laughs> No. The, one, the one thing you're not going to see in Never Settle Bundle will be Batman Origins. Is that it? Batman Origins? Because NVIDIA's already made deals with them. So Yes, they, they're giving out free-to-play games as well as a not-so-free-to-play game, which is Arkham Asylum Origin, yeah, I believe. Yes. That's going to be a nice game. So Also, I haven't played any of those. No. Just I played like 15 minutes of the first. It's kind of sad. How many times I, have you played that 15 minutes of the first? Just once. Oh, so it wasn't a benchmark? No, it's got a built-in benchmark for Arkham City. And Sweet. then I stopped using that because it was such a pain in the ass. IFA, it stands for something German. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. Because it's un Lacun Volleyball or something like that. But it's all mobile stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Lenovo reveals the Yoga 2 Pad and ThinkPad Yoga Convertible PCs. Now, Yoga was kind of popular there. It was the laptop thingy that can go into multiple positions, hence Yoga. Or a 
sex harness swing thing. But uh, no, that was Global Foundries. Yeah, <sighs> Josh, it's not funny. What kind of resolution is that? Thirty-two hundred by sixteen? Are you yeah. kidding? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Talk about yoga. There was a reason I actually included this because some of the resolutions coming out are just impressive. I'd say obscene, but you already took that. What kind of chip can really drive that? What kind of interconnect are, are they using? Is it DisplayPort? I have no idea, but that's. Mind you, I don't know what a QHD plus touchscreen is either. Well, I guess we're bound to find out, aren't we? The one one cool thing I did hear about the new yogas is they fixed the keyboard issue with the original ones. The key, supposedly, you know, this is something I read somewhere or heard somewhere or something. But supposedly, the keys when you put it in a tablet position and put the uh, thing on his back, the keys actually retract into the body. So there's no uh, there's less harm, you know, there's less damaging actually due to the keyboard as opposed to the first gen. Because when I'm skipping that across the table, and I hit the salt shaker, I don't want keys to pop off. Oh, but it won't work because it's got rubber bumpers. Ooh. There, there is something very odd, and uh, I mean, I'd, I'd have to go back to Tim to find out exactly what he means. But they've included something that they're referring to as a lift and lock system. So when you're in tablet mode... When, when you've decided to flip it all the way, you know, break its back, and now the keyboard is on the bottom and you're playing with a tablet, apparently there's actually bumpers that sort of lift up and come out so you're not going to touch anything with the keys as you're using it as a tablet. That's a pretty good idea because that was like the one bad thing about the original Yoga is that the keys would just kind of sit on the table. They'd be deactivated, but they'd just kind of sit there and rub against the table, which is a little weird. Yeah, well... Taking a laptop and going like that. Well, you know. I also thought was weird before, but I've encountered two people at work that have actually done that and then complained that it didn't work so well after. <laughs> weird. <laughs> oh, the life of a help support desk individual. Oh, yeah. That's why we drink, right, Josh? Yeah, uh, one of the reasons. Ah, what a many. I'm not married. You don't have children either. No. Do you ever yeah, wonder Josh, why you, you don't have, have a teenage and I don't. daughter who's about to start driving either? Wow, so much for insurance rates. Uh, so much for the rest of your hair. Grow it long so when you tear it out, it actually. No, oh, no. Actually, actually, my insurance rates. Uh, oh, well, theoretically, my ex-wife should be covering her insurance. We'll see how long that lasts. But. So. <laughs> yeah, ex-wives kind of stick around. Not that I would know. That's what I've heard. Anyway, uh, moving along, Linksys shows off smart Wi-Fi AC 1900-802.11 AC router. I have not cared about networking no. for ages. But oh, look, but come on, it's got detachable peanut, or I mean removable <laughs> antenna. And you are going to constantly have three green lines, arcs, over each antenna. Yes. Or at least but one. This All uses the, the new qu- uh, CAM, uh, the QAM modulation. So if you've got a wireless car that actually uses it, hey, you're looking at 600 megabits. Easy. If you don't, I remember when I was excited for 19 megabit. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's wires, though. But if you like the green lines, get the Linksys. Nice. Panasonic launches 20-inch tough pad. Good lord, that's massive. A 20-inch tough pad. Apparently, you they've also drop... perfected holograms. Yes. So, we got that going for us. Yeah, well, Asus told me that they'd done that before as well. But, come on. It's got an i5 in it. It's got discrete NVIDIA graphics. 8 gigs of RAM. Uh, if you get the normal one, it's 128 gigs SSD. If you get the performance one, it's 256 gig uh, SSD running Windows 8.1, and the the fact that it's a tablet with those specs is rather and impressive. I'm not sure, quite sure how the hell they fit that GPU in there, but they did. Uh, it does weigh better part of 7 pounds, I believe. 
uh, for the pro, or sorry, uh, yeah, just under six pounds. So it's it's hefty. It's also got a 3840 by 2560 resolution. So there's another resolution for you to memorize. And it comes with a funky new pen, which I, I don't know if this is going to be just advertisement talk or if it's actually going to be worth it. But they claim it has up to 2048, so 2K levels of pressure. So when you're drawing, you can actually push hard or soft and it's going to work and also angle of tilt so you know if you're an architect that is making gobs and gobs of money you can t- buy this and show it off to your clients draw their building as they're watching and it's a tough pad it's like the sanitary napkin of pads you could shove it anywhere and it'll do its job and with a discrete GPU it'll probably cauterize it too probably Moving along, I think we've hit rock bottom. Shiba launches 8-inch tablet running Windows 8.1. 8.1's not even available yet. And Toshiba, they've had some interesting times with tablets, haven't they? As in not being very terribly successful with them. Yes, no, maybe? Not so much. Yeah, you, the don't satellites. Hear a whole lot you can't kill them. a satellite. Tablet, on the other hand. Not so good. So they got an 8-incher. And it's something to brag about, apparently. Except, uh, boy, it's not a fantastic resolution. 1280 by 800. It's got Bay Trail in it. Oh, but it's got the quad-core Bay Trail. So, how much? 329 or 220? 329. That seems like it's a little bit of money for an 8-inch tablet. What do you think, Jeremy? Because you know, you're you own many tablets. Oh, it, yes. Uh, most of them are slate and use chalk, but, you know, it, it's yeah, it's a toss-up. It could be interesting to see if Toshiba can actually make it into the slate, uh, to the tablet market. But to be honest, you know, I don't know. I think uh, Samsung's going to be a little bit better off with their Galaxy Note 3. Because the Galaxy Note 3, you know, it's a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to use familiar 1920 by 1080 resolution and you know for the it's it's going to be interesting it's they're going the usual way with their arm and snapdragon so either a quad core or an octa core three gigs of ram 32 gig or 64 gigs internal storage depending on what you want to pay but I mean, is it really worth it just to be able to say, hey, I got a tablet that natively runs Jelly Bean? Well, it's not Jelly Bean. It's, it's Windows 8.1. And that's kind of the big push for them because all the Is inexpensive it? tablets right now are all... Samsung? I moved on no. to the big little one. Arcos, whatever. I don't know. There, there, there's hundreds of tablet makers out there, but hardly any of them will have 8.1 products anytime soon. Running on x86. And we all know about Surface RT, fun <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, 329 seems like kind of a hard sell in this current marketplace. But anyway, moving along. Samsung, speaking of Samsung. Oh, I just launches a g- did that. Galaxy Note 3 yeah, smartphone? Yeah, I, ju- I just did that. You did. Oh wait, I thought you were talking. I'm still talking about the Toshiba. No, I got bored of the Toshiba and moved on because honestly, you and I we're not <sighs> Jedi mobiles. mind trick, Jeremy. Alan you got to stop. Those. Alan likes his mobiles. I don't even hear. Alan, are you going to buy one of saying. these? Which ones? I'm a vegan. <laughs> You're a vegan. <laughs> what? <laughs> Can we that? move along? Where did that even come HDMI from? HDMI 2.0. How yeah, awesome is HDMI it? HDMI 2.0. What 4K at 60 exactly. hertz, which is double of what HDMI 1.4 is able to do. Just ask Ken and Ryan as they have attached HDMI to 4K monitors with limited success. Ken, so how does it, how does it like auto lip sync? Too too I mean, not too little too late, but this is something they should have come out with when they came out with the 4K monitors. I mean, this it's kind of stupid, actually. Hmm. Bad time. Well, is it stupid or is it the fact that DisplayPort sort of 
water down the market and there was this big argument about which way they should go and everyone sort of went neither way. Well, yeah, but they could have come out. I mean, what I'm saying is they could have come out with HDMI 2.0 when they released the four, when they started releasing the 4K TVs and all because they knew 60 hertz was going to be right around a corner. 60 hertz, hertz isn't can't important use on, on a, a TV. Computer. 60 hertz isn't really important on a TV. No, but it's Content important. Content is in 2997. But who the hell watches see. TVs anymore? Or well, 27 or 23.9, whatever. Five, four, whatever it is. I mean, if it's a TV, like, I don't know. I, I like 60 hertz on my computer monitors, but I don't use TVs as computer monitors. The cool thing about this is at least one vendor has announced a upgrade to HDMI 2.0 for their sets, and that's Sony. <laughs> doesn't even really seem like it'd be that possible. You think it'd have to be new silicon, but... You know, apparently it is. Overclock. <laughs> yes. Overclock, Overclock it. monitors. And Ken, Steam would disagree Just, with you. I, I agree with you. I don't play games on my TV, but Steam would suggest that people do that. Maybe. I don't know. A lot more people watch TV than use Steam Big Picture. I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, at two in win, would you buy an $800 case? Would you? And would you cut yourself when installing this damn thing? Oh, is this the case is that I'm thinking of? That is, a, that is an awesome case, though, Josh. That is, is an it? awesome case. Yes. It's, what if it's you tap it with a hammer? Will you have a it case of solid color, and then you turn on an LED, and it's crystal clear. That's awesome. I mean, that is, that, that's even better than those BMW thermal take, thermal, thermal take Level cases. Level 10 GT. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, yeah, this case, I mean, yeah, I couldn't buy it because, well, my wife would castrate me, but no. I, that's that's it's Current awesome. Current or X? He can't hear me. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, $800 case. We've seen a few of them before. This one looks rather unique. Watch out for paper cuts or glass cuts. Lenovo announces the ThinkPad W540 mobile workstation. Lenovo has been kind of the go-to for workstation-like tablets. If you think you're being transported back to 2001, this is the laptop for you. It's thick. It's big. It's kind of monochromatic. It is as far away from an Ultrabook as you could possibly go. And it's and got a number pad. It'll look like a monolith. Are the monkeys throwing bones at it? Yes, and they're bouncing right off. Sweet. I, I personally miss the W700 series they had with the little fold-out LCD on the side, the little, like, <laughs> five-inch LCD. <laughs> Did you ever see one of those in person? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I never have. Uh, uh, but just to quickly run it down, this is an obscene notebook. It's got an i7, up to 32 gigs of RAM, an NVIDIA Quadro, with Optimus support, of course, and a two terabyte hard drive with optional RAID if you need it. It's got Wi Fi, it's got RAID. 4G, it's got every frickin' thing that you need that you would want in a giant tower, but yet in a notebook that if you put that on your lap. What lap? Don't worry, you're not gonna need chil you're not gonna have children ever. It'll Children, sterilize you in be a able second. To, you're going to be able to smell burning meat if you put it on your lap. Oh, yeah. And, and bizarrely, and what is this? Like, I mean, I'm sick of 1366. You know, this is a horrible resolution. But for this one, it's 2880 by 1620. Remember the it's, good old days when you could, like, memorize all the resolutions? No, it's strange Apparently resolution. Like, everyone's picking a different resolution. Damn them all. At least it's IPS. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a nice workstation. I bet it's going to have a nice price point to it. Oh, yeah. As well. About 20 And weigh 80. about 15 pounds. How's that for those mobile warriors? Hmm. Ah, finally, a steamy family. Steamy, steamy, gooey family. And I'm not talking big picture. Yes. This was Scott. And none of us here are Scott. 
<laughs> Last time I checked, I wasn't Canadian. But well, one of us is. Maybe he I am, could take but I it. moved away from uh, Kingston. He's still there. Yeah, you know, Microsoft, their, their games division sort of collapsed when they wanted to try and figure out how to share games. Well, Steam's going to go for it. Gabe Newell might be able to pull it off, but guess what? You can now share games with your younger brother, older sister, or whatever. But there are caveats. You share your entire library, and only one person can be playing at a time. Not a game. Only one person can be playing from the library. Yes. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think that's a. Uh, that was just a rush design decision or something. That, that's what it sounds like to me. But you know, I don't know if, it's, a, if it stays that way. It's like a non-starter, though. Well, right. we'll see. We'll see. Maybe if it's, version two point oh will actually fix it. Yeah. Well, come uh, on. Well, it's like it is. It is in beta, right? Has anyone on this yeah. podcast actually used Steam Big Picture? Mm. Inadvertently, I saw an icon <laughs> on it and I clicked on it once. And I, I don't like, mean Whoa. pushing the button accidentally in the corner. Yeah, I, mean, I was like, "Hey, purposely. this is now taking the whole screen. How do I get out of it?" I don't know. I don't, I'm not like. I see the idea of hooking a PC up to a TV instead of a console, and it's all nice and everything. I just don't play games on TVs. I, I guess but, people. But do. if you did, it would be well, awesome. Ryan did with his big fancy TV tray. Yeah. See, it Ryan's like a candidate for that. Yeah. You have to have the setup, right? Also, my TV is 32 inches in 720p, so not ideal when I have a 1440p monitor on my desk. Oh, it takes a brave man to admit that, Ken. <laughs> it's not about what? the size of the resolution, he doesn't, need a, he, he doesn't even need a TV. He lives in, like, a shoebox. Not really. And his uterus fell oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the wrong limerick. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think we've worn out our welcome on the internet multiple times over. So it's time to hard to get to the. It's time to hard to get. It's time to get to the hardware software picks of the week. Mine is obviously beer and a lack of sobriety. Next. Well, I was going to pick the same thing, but uh, come on, you you right now have a chance to spend a grand on RAM. You can get DDR3100 from Avexir. It's going to give you almost a 5, maybe 7% advantage over RAM that only costs 60, 70 bucks. So, totally worth it, you know, if, if you have to brag to your neighbors about something. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's two grand now, isn't it? $19.99. It's only two grand. Come on. Why wouldn't you pick this? I would People, really don't uh, encourage them. Bragging tonight rights you're gonna overclock stupid. like your memory's worth nineteen ninety nine. I I'd really Mr. love to see and I ever spent. I'd really love to see the list the list of motherboard, not motherboards, that the XMP profiles there have been There is tested one on. motherboard. We talked about it earlier. Uh, and if that's not fast enough, I believe they do have uh, 3200 for about 3500 bucks. Oh, thank, you know? thank God. It's a dollar a megahertz. <laughs> Go for it. Come on. I, actually, Ken, most of the Haswell motherboards, the... Uh what the Z87 motherboard supported, you know, the M power, or sorry, not the M power, the X power, the Gigabyte the OC Force, the Asus Maximus 6, all the super high end ones have, do support 3000 and do have been tested with it. So, because it's bragging rights for the motherboard manufacturers to support it, whether you or I could actually see that <laughs> ever. So. Fair enough. It's 80% off, it's normally $8,000. Can get, How could you not buy it? Can get an extra hey, hundred megahertz hey look, it's for only five hundred twenty four hundred bucks. No, this is 29. the thirty two hundred. Oh no, that's the thirty two hundred. Oh, SBC twenty four eighty is I, it, or twenty four eight hundred. I mean, if you're gonna spend two grand, why not spend twenty five hundred dollars? I know. I mean, not only are these gold plated, but the Pope urinated on them. Ooh, <laughs> Pope is actually your cooling system. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. so go out and buy those right now. <laughs> now, uh, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, I helped my child uh, put together a 
an alarm clock from Timex. And this thing was actually really cool. I wish I had one when I was a child. It would glow. It had the indiglo effect with multiple different colors. It had all these soothing sounds come out of it, like the ocean and seagulls and some new age type music. For 19 bucks, this would have lasted me hours and hours as a small child, and I'd have used it daily to go to sleep, staring longingly at the indiglo. LED backlit soundy thing. It's kind of amazing what even small products are doing these days. So yeah, if you need a little alarm clock that's cheap, this one's kind of Use fun. Your phone. I, I spent a good half hour playing with it tonight. That was money well spent. <laughs> I know. I, more fun than the cell phone, wasn't it, Josh? It was. Yeah. I, and I'm probably going to use this longer after I stole it from my child. I just I can't, I can't find uh, the joke here. I know there's an obvious one. I just can't uh, find it. You don't want to. Don't worry. With experience, Ken, you will eventually learn how to make the joke. Okay, Ken, go with this. It's contoured for Josh's pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have a vibrate feature? No. Lame. It's only three. It's only three AAA batteries. So, you know, if they had gone three D cells, it's not made by Hitachi. It's not Hitachi. <laughs> it's not plug-in. Hitachi me in the wrong place. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Maury, tell us what you got. No, it's Alan. Alan. Alan, I haven't heard much from you today. I've been so lonely. You have. <laughs> he looks like he's pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody Alan, talked about storage. storage. I'm, upset. I'm, I'm upset so bored. Josh is, Josh is I wish people so would talk me. to me. <laughs> Makes me very upset. Oh. All right, so uh, Josh, remember that camera that you got? Yes. And since there was a newer version that came out yeah. after that yeah. one, which is the reason I I passed my other one to you, right? And then you since passed then, it in the most lovingly way possible. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's my old old camera, and then that was my old camera, and then this is my current camera. So this is the HX three hundred. So what, what actually? Which one do you have, Josh? HX1? You just have the HX1? Yeah. Yeah, like, HX1. Then there was, I thought there was, maybe there was a 100 in there? I don't there know. There was a 1000. Wasn't no, there? Or no, 100. No, no, it must have been a 100. Was, that's like that. You're thinking Terminator. Anyway. Um, so this thing is kind of cool because it does basically the kind of stuff that uh, Josh's does, but it does it faster and it has a pretty insane zoom. It goes to 1200 millimeters now. So 24 to 1200 millimeter optically stabilized zoom. So you can basically handhold shots out at 1200 millimeter with no tripod. I mean, there's a limit, obviously. If you have like arthritis or something, it's probably going to be a shaky picture. But, you know, it's pretty good. And uh, the processing inside the camera seems much faster than the previous models. So if you have any experience with those, you take one of those pictures that's like, you know, uh, Low light, no flash, that sort of thing. It has like some modes to it where you can do that, that sort of thing. Uh, and it takes several shots in a row and then it merges them together. Well, that process usually takes a few seconds after you've taken the shot. Uh, this one seems much quicker. And it uh, does some other cool stuff. Like Actually, this was in the, the just prior model to this, but there's no longer a charging port. There's no longer like a power port on the camera. It doesn't come with a power adapter. It's just charge over USB. Wait, this has a power adapter to it? Yours, doesn't it? Josh has I, never charged that camera. Hmm. He's also wow, never taken the lens cap off. How do, you, don't how, do you charge, how do you charge that one, Josh? I forget. Is that USB? No, I, I, I pull out the battery. Yeah, there you I go. So, charge so it in that, the wall. So that model came, you had to take the battery out and stick it in a little brick that came with it <laughs> to charge it, right? Uh, so like a camera. Yeah. Got it. It only fit in one oh. way, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so and then, and then this one... Uh, it came with the power adapter, but it was not. You didn't take the battery out and put it on the on the thing. It had like, it had a little extra door at the bottom there. You'd open it up and you'd plug in a little power adapter deal, right? And then that would charge the camera. Or this one, which is the 200, you could also charge over USB if you wanted. It just took a while. Well, now the only method of charging it is USB. Not sure I like that. Uh, it's it's actually pretty quick because I think the camera, they've done some refinements to it to make it really sip power. For example, the battery is only 
No, they, you can still remove the battery, though. You can still remove the battery, okay. but there's really no need. Well, do all. they sell yeah, a battery it's charger? Yeah, product. Uh, an external battery charger? Yeah. They probably do. Because with Sony, they usually do. Because with cameras, I usually keep two or three in my bag charged up, and <laughs> no, just I get it. I get for, it for the whole trip. Cameras, I don't have to worry about batteries. I'll just change it out. Instead these of, cameras go so long on batteries. Cameras. Yeah. Like, it's just so long, it's ridiculous. Start recording video on that camera. True. Uh, I think this one will do a good hour, though, on the battery. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I sort of relate it in terms of, you know, for, for typical people, they're just going on an outing or whatnot. It's going to be enough. Yeah. You know? Um, and then, worst case, since it's charge over USB, you can just have one of those, you know, USB charge brick deals with you. True. If you wanted to. And between, you know, when you're using it, just plug it in. Let it charge. But... Yep, seems pretty impressive. Um, I really can't find any things to ding it on just yet. I've used it a few times already. Um, I wish they but would aren't increase the... are you already the, uh, jealous over the new iPhone where you were just yeah, that's, amazed okay, that's, at how quick it was taking the stills? That's one thing that could be a ding, actually, because this camera will do 10 frames per second for one second, and that stinking new iPhone will do 10 frames per second until it runs out of memory. That sounds like an interesting test I should rig up. Yeah. Yeah. See how the many IO images. is going to be fascinating with that particular product. Hmm. I'm surprised they could write to the Flash that quickly in the first place. Hence, I, I said going. IO is going to be particularly fascinating with that product. Yes, exactly. Uh, Alan doesn't I care have... about IO. He never does. Not care. only that, but, but IO is going. Okay. Can we move forward? <laughs> Is that your pick? Oh. Are you done with your pick? Really? That's it. Do we have to segue into the iPhone 5S? Which no, we we're going to segue into Mori. That's going to be oh. Ken's pick, right? That's disgusting. <laughs> Mori. <laughs> Thanks. You're up. Mori, uh, tell us about your pick. <laughs> my pick was the new uh, test bench from Premature. They've been working on this test bench for a while. I've seen stuff on it since... You know, I've been trying to follow it since probably about June or July. It's basically a polycarbonate acrylic, something like that. It's toolless. It is actually three pieces or four pieces. It's got the top, and it's got the two sides, and it's got a bottom. And I think there's a panel on the back. It's uh, it's made for water cooling. It will support a 3x120 or 3x140 radiator in the back. And you can also mount barbs on the on the top unit where the motherboard tray sits uh, to uh, if you want pass throughs or whatnot it's it's a really cool it's a really cool test bench um, you know I saw they had a couple people had them at QuakeCon uh, you know a lot of people are building systems off them you know a lot of the uh, OC teams and reviewers had them in hand in June or July August was when they started putting out the uh, the uh, review samples in bulk um, but you know, I've, I've been waiting for this thing for, for a while, e eagerly anticipating it. It just came out really nice. The other thing, the real other nice thing that they did with it was you can actually pick it in multiple colors. You can have your the top layer where the motherboard sits can be different color than the sides and the back panel. Um, you know, you can have, like, clear side and back panel on a black top panel or whatever. I mean, so it's, it's very configurable. It's And, you know, it's just a very well-designed bench made specifically for enthusiasts and water cooling type type uh, stuff so and it's it's pretty reasonably priced too 139 dollars for for a fully f uh featured test bench like that is is a really good price that's nice morning i'm glad you enjoy such things because i do not i'm a simple man simple pleasures and my pleasure right now is getting out of this podcast with some semblance of dignity. Too late. Sorry about so that, with Josh. that, I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Alan Malmontano. And I'm Mari Teitelman. You can get a hold of us at uh, 188-38-PC-PER if you want to call and talk to Ryan, though whether he answers that or listens to it at all, it's a good question. You can email us at uh, podcast at pcper.com. You can find us at pcper.com slash podcast. I've got a Twitter account. Jeremy's got a Twitter account. Maury's got a Twitter account. Ryan's got one. You know what? There's a search function in Twitter. Go find it. Join us. 
see what kind of interesting things are said. And with that, I wish you a fond farewell. Good night. Au revoir.